So we got a classic NDXC Rock Shock. What's it attached to? What is this? A Bontrager mountain bike? Yeah, these are very, very not common and very unique. Yeah, let's review this gym. Blast from the past. Let's bring back steel from the 90s. After this. Welcome to I Know A Guy Bicycles. Welcome to I Know A Guy Bicycles. Hanging out with the guy. Hi, I'm Justin the guy. Obviously, I have a garage shop. Taking scary how to use bikes one bike at a time. If you like these videos, please like and subscribe. Welcome back to I Know A Guy Bicycles. Hanging with the guy. Hey, I'm Justin the guy on this old bike series. And woo, we need to go back in time. Time, that is. Oh, over 20 years time. That's right. Check this out. This is a Bond Traeger OR Santa Cruz built. As you can see the sign behind me, mountain bike. This is one of those made Bond Traeger's name in the 90s and caught track's attention. And this is one of those gems. This was right at the time that Trek acquired Bond Traeger and they were still making steel frames. So we're going to do a little review on the history on this bike and talk about what Bontrager is today. But first and foremost, there are several articles out there that go back in time of Keith Bontrager building, using a motocross kind of thing, building motorcycles, and he also is in mountain biking because mountain biking has become a, a thing in the late 80s, early 90s, right? And he's in California, and he's a cat, and he's a welder. So there you go, an engineer type in the kind of guy, and he decided that need to make a frame that's going to be a little more stout and it's going to hold up to the abuses of off-road riding. Well, this was it. So you won't see these being produced today. That is a yesteryear's thing. Um, they are still making steel and titanium bikes out there from different manufacturers, which is awesome with the 27 and 29 inch wheels. Good deal. This is prior disc brakes um, and all that. This particular uh, acquisition here is a very special one because this frame was actually originally sold to, or the bike was sold to, a team mechanic that worked for Bontrager Trek at the time. And that mechanic, you know, may have rode it a couple times. Being a mechanic, we're just too busy doing this thing versus that thing. So it didn't get very much use. Then it got sold to a buddy of his, and that basically sat for the last two decades. <laughs> so this bike has actually been very 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 little use and in pristine condition and what's really cool about it it has a majority of its original OEM parts so back in the day they had the XTX XT cranks uh, which is a step down from XTR um, I believe this is an eight speed back with um, XT rear derailleur part of the interruption there is more more you say push the more button push it push it I dare you to push it. Once you push that button, you get more details about the video you are watching in addition to all the tools that I use in the shop as well as suggestion for improving your ride. In addition to, to help me provide advocacy in the cycling community, also links to other social media accounts as well as my website to find the products that I actually sell and other insights in the industry. Other videos linked below, extend your cycling experience here on YouTube. And now back to your original programming. I went through this bike already and cleaned it up when I first got it a couple years ago. And unfortunately, it just hung there. Um, and I'm a very proponent of bikes need to be ridden. Yeah, you can probably hang this up in a museum somewhere, but my basement is no one's museum. <laughs> so anywho, um, we're gonna get this guy ready to go. And some lucky individual out there is gonna know what it is and gonna go, I want that now. But before that, I wanted to do a little recap. So we're talking about this frame and what made it very unique. Well, what made it unique to me, to Parker Bikes, to the Bontrager, we were a Trek dealer in the 90s, right? So being a Trek dealer in the 90s, when Trek started you know, buying all these other companies, we had access to bringing those lines into our store. Klein was one, Bontrager was the other one. 
Bontrager had mountain bikes. Klein were a little more for road bikes, but they carried mountain too. We were excited about these additions to our lines because we can get it all in one place. And then we still carried, that's when Schwinn was kind of gone away. We had Mongoose and we had GT and then we brought in Jameis. So we had other, you know, we were a bike shop, like all bike shops back then, had about five or six lines. I mean, that was just the norm. Nowadays is more specific, but anyway, we're not talking about that. We're talking about where this came from and how it affected us. Anyway, at Barker Bikes, we were excited about these steel bikes that are coming in. Actually, we just we just grabbed onto the Kool Aid like nothing else. A guy in Cali designing a frame. It was kind of like all American dream, right? Who could not like that story? And in addition to the, all the subtle details, I mean, so he had gusseted underneath the steel frame of the seat tube or uh, top tube and the down tube. He had little gussets in the chain stays and all these little texts. You can look up all those pictures online and check those out. And the dropouts were unique because they were square. They're supposed to hold the, the spindle uh, in a particular way, that kind of thing. And he also had a one inch headset on these guys, which is more known for road bike, but the inch and eighth has become more of the norm shortly after this. But these rock shafts were custom made crowns with the angle, I think it was 72 degrees or something like that, a degree different than your standard mountain bike. So the idea behind that, it gave you a little more control and speed with that type of frame. But we drank the Kool-Aid. We loved it. I mean, it was the, you know, the, the cleanness of it, you know, it was the simple simplicity, the nice little, the welded details, the gusseted head uh, tube here. So all those little things, this frame alone is just magical. Well, this was the upper end one that was actually produced in Santa Cruz before they shut that facility down. I unfortunately missed it by one year because I have family at the time living in Monterey, really close, and I was out to visit. I called them like, hey, I want to take a tour of your place. And they're like, oh man, there's nothing really left to see. We're pretty much shutting everything down. I'm like, if you were here a year ago, you would have seen everything. I'm like, damn. Anyway, the case may be, it's like I missed the opportunity. We had the, the run line of these. They didn't have like very many models, like five or six, but we carried them. There's a couple of ones that I have my eye for that are unicorns. You'll never see these ever. Um, one is a cyclocross frame <laughs> because I love cyclocross bikes, which is the pre-gravel. And in addition to, they made a titanium. That was pretty sweet. I don't know if Keith Bontrager made the titaniums himself in the Santa Cruz facility because there was a place up in Washington State, Oregon, I think, or in Oregon close to that area, was making titaniums for other companies because they were outfitted for it. It's a whole different ball game. But going back to the, the big influence of Bontrager bikes, the bikes were really cool. And they also made BMX bikes. Uh, Trek took, you know, that's when the BMX was starting to be a, a, a big thing. And they actually had a couple years of BMX bikes. Um, a couple of my mechanic friends had them. They were pretty slick. They're all heavy as hell, like all of them. But anyway, you definitely compared to the GTs and uh, the Diamondbacks of the day and so forth, but they were pretty cool. Um, Trek was working on the rebranding and they've added these different flavors. What's really interesting about it though, they just didn't take their frame and put a you know, Trek sticker on it. What they did is they kept those brands unique to themselves. So for a few years, I think it was three, maybe four years, they let Keith just build these frames and they were moved to um, Waterloo, Wisconsin from the two years that they were in Santa Cruz. Uh, they were a few years, yeah, Santa Cruz. So it was a few years before that, that Keith was building up his business in California until Trek uh, uh, figured him out, found him and going, ah, we want you. And they were, he was along the lines with others, but he did bring a lot of value to the Trek world, like they didn't really think about. And he was pretty revolutionary. And you'll see his name on all sorts of parts, accessories from the Trek line. He still has his finger on a lot of that stuff. And that was the branding that needed to happen because Trek was trying to play with different names like Icon and Matrix and this other stuff that didn't really stick or resonate to people, uh, uh, customers. But when they had the Bontrager name, knowing from a Bontrager company, which maybe fell in some circles, it got, it got recognized and held on to. So things worked out really well for Bontrager. He's still with Trek today and still producing all sorts of cool stuff. But unfortunately, the bike line kind of got canned after about three years. 
Not sure the reason. There's a lot of you know articles of saying like, well, he decided to go a different direction, or Trek just didn't see the value of steel anymore. It was it was the precursor of the dissolvement of the actual lines that they acquired: Lamont, Klein, um, Gary Fisher, uh, Rolf Wheels. So Trek bought all these companies, and slowly over the decade ish. Um, they kind of shrunk down. The last holdout was Gary Fisher, and the Gary Fisher's line just basically got melded. And you'll still see the names of his line still within the Trek product mix, but the Gary Fisher is now technically completely out. So finally, after all in a day, the last man standing is Bontrager himself. So old Keith here um, did some cool things like anti-chain suck device underneath. The tubing is really neat. The, all those kinds of things. I wish I had time to mountain bike ride like I did. I've kind of aged out in the sense that I'm looking for different types of riding. I still ride a lot, but it's more recreational. I have a seven year old, I'm an older dad, so things are just not melding for me. And plus, I don't bounce anymore. When I hit the ground, it's a hard thud and it hurts and it usually equates to ER visits. So I gotta cut those kinds of things out. Granted, I take my cycle cross bike and do those light trails. <laughs> because that's just me um, but in the day I just can't do the the big trips on the mountain bike and I figure you know this day and age I'm just gonna go rent something really cool and try it out for a weekend that kind of deal because I just don't have the financial lift to spend five grand on a bike and to be outdated within a year because I won't be able to ride it till next year so anyway that's a little tidbit what you can do for yourself if you want to get into some kind of riding and just don't have the time for it but this gym and those other kind of cool features was the stickers were not clear coded. So you could actually buy the sticker kit and replace it or change colors if you wanted to. It was kind of a neat little thing. That's basically kind of like a powder coat with a clear coat on top of it. Pretty solid paint job. They're pretty sturdy. This one cleaned up really well. Also, this is back in the day when they had shocks that matched the paint jobs. <laughs> that was kind of cool. This one was outfitted with speed springs. If you don't know what that is, it took the old Lassimer guts out, put a spring in there. It's really kind of cushy and pogo-y. Ah, what the hell? That's just fun. Um, this is also where the generation with the actual travel got to be something um, versus just a quarter inch of like the Soa shocks from Trek, the Black Diamond 1 or Black Diamond 2 or whatever it was. It's like going eat and you had like four pounds extra to your bike. Um, this is where the actual Rock Shock and Manitou's were actually worth a damn um, and actually did their job. So that actually changed the actual pitch of the bike, which was adjusted for in the geometry. That was a big kind of shift back in the day because you'd have a, a bike that was designed for a rigid fork and you threw a suspension on it and it was all out of whack. <laughs> so um, the, the, the had a suspension design frames were a thing and they would actually got to a point they would actually put stickers on some of the bikes not, not particular bond trackers but you'll see some of the old ones out there's like suspension design They're like don't they all come with suspension no, anyway that's kind of the tidbit so i just wanted to do that review of this awesome bond tracker race or bike from santa cruz and it actually came from somewhere cool instead of just a production line team mechanic Buddy owned it, sat in a garage. I cleaned it up and fixed it all up. Gonna go ride it. There's no time. So I'm gonna have to part ways with it because, you know, it should be used. At the end of the day, a bike should be ridden. Or if it does go in a museum, at least it's being seen by somebody else besides just me going to do laundry, you know. Anywho, beautiful barn tracker. Hope you have best of luck. Thanks for hanging out with me. Until next time, from the garage, have a wonderful day.